welcome. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, as always, um, a lot of people are interested in these fantastic presentations. I am Emmanuel Rota. Uh, I'm the director of the European Union Center with my new artisanal air cat. <laughs> that is the result, of course, of uh, our quarantine process. But uh, today I, I'm very, very happy to be here to introduce uh, Professor Judith Pinter, uh, who uh, is, of course, uh, an associate of the European uh, Union Center, as well as being an associate of our RIS uh, colleagues. Uh, and so we are very, very uh, happy that uh, we were first in line and we managed to steal her from our competition, friendly competition, and having her present today for us, although in uh, close conjunction with our race colleague. And the title of today's presentation is Trolls at Play, uh, Teaching Propaganda, Media Manipulation and Election Interference Through Role Play Online. Uh, and of course, uh, we are uh, teaching, uh, everybody's teaching online, but uh, Professor Pinter uh, has been uh, among the first to start a process of self-reflection of what it means uh, and how uh, classes should be changed and how teaching a class that was long scheduled has to be transformed and reimagined uh, to keep it interesting and relevant uh, in uh, the situation we are, we are living. And because of course, uh, Professor Pinter is not just uh, an expert on uh, information technology and in question of uh, online and uh, gamification, I think that's, that's the word, uh, so much so that she's our campus expert on uh, the uh, Playful by Design initiative, an initiative we hope all we know about because it's such a great and fantastic initiative that she has been uh, organizing uh, and of course imagining uh, from the beginning uh, to the point that of course she received uh, the very prestigious presidential uh, award for this and to uh, put it forward. Uh, Professor Pinter is an expert on, I would say, uh, perhaps I'm wrong and she can correct me, at least two different things. W one is manipulation. Uh, she wrote books on uh, hypnosis, so how to uh, basically make people do things they are not inclined to uh, do on their own or, or they are kind of gently pushed to do. Uh, and of course, manipulation has been a big theme of her research uh, since uh, uh, her passion for uh, Eastern Europe. She uh, started as an expert on the ex-Yugoslavia and then she expanded in, in so many different areas. Uh, th there is uh, somebody with a mic on, uh, please, uh, somebody, uh, I'm told that there is a lot of return online, so please uh, uh, mute your, your microphone if you don't have to participate. So uh, again, in addition to being a teaching associate professor of information sciences, Dr. Pinto is the director of Playful by Design. And as I was saying, uh, she has been devoting a lot of her research uh, on these questions, both teaching and, and manipulation and manipulation online. And uh, that became very, very handy to start this process of self-reflection on how teaching online works and how you can transform your class. I don't wanna to waste too much of your time with my introduction. Um, I just wanna say that Professor Pinter is gonna pr present for about 45 minutes. Uh, and then she's kind enough uh, to take questions from the audience. And I'm assumed that there will be a lot of interesting questions. Uh, Please submit uh, your questions uh, through uh, the chat, uh, either privately to me or to uh, everybody to see. And I will read them uh, to Professor Pinter, who then will address uh, the questions uh, live. Uh, so without uh, much further ado, uh, I just wanna remind you that there is also another event coming on Wednesday, organized by the European Union Center, uh, with our colleague, David O'Brien, who is gonna present on uh, the, the artistic representation of uh, contagion uh, and uh, in the Napoleonic era. 
uh, that's going to be on Wednesday at four. Uh, you find all the information on our newly designed, fantastic website, uh, the website of the European Union Center. Uh, but again, I'm uh, already done with all this announcement. We are very, very proud to have uh, Professor Judith Pinto with us today. And please uh, join me in welcoming her. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. That was really kind. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Um, I'm going to stop my video uh, just so it's not a distraction. Um, and then I'm going to ask uh, your uh, patience if, um, while I'm sharing the screen, it gets a little chaotic uh, for a minute. There's a lot of moving parts, and I don't want to give you too much whiplash. I'll do my best. Um, so I assume you're still hearing me. Um, right, so um, this talk um, I would have given um, to the EUC conference, which was scheduled uh, for this month and had to be canceled. And they contacted me and they said, would I be interested in giving it online? And um, obviously I was because um, the topic really is um, or change to be uh, about how this particular course ended up um, going online um, with some uh, difficulties. So this is um, what I'll be talking about the next 45 minutes. I'm gonna start out a little bit talking about immersive learning on this campus um, and as I do it in iFlex classrooms. And um, Ava Wolf, who uh, is in charge of the iFlex classrooms across campus pointed out to me that some people might not know what an iFlex classroom is. Um, so I thought I'd start out by um, telling you a little bit about these classrooms and um, why I teach in them and what I teach in them. Um, I taught this uh, class, which is the subject of my talk today, this global informatics seminar on narrative AI, media manipulation and election interference uh, in an iFlex classroom. And why the fact that I did that then made it so challenging for me to have to take um, that class online. So that's um, basically where I'll be going uh, during this talk today. So what's an iFlex classroom? So iFlex, um, the flex part is innovative, flexible learning uh, experiences. <clears throat> that's how we get the iFlex. And um, there are several iFlex classrooms across, across campus. I've taught in six of them. Uh, I think I may, I don't know if I still have the record for having taught in more than anybody else. Probably somebody has beat me by now. I've taught in the iFlex classroom in animal sciences lab, in education, in psychology, and the three um, special uh, classrooms uh, that are in Armory itself. <clears throat> this one that you're looking at, this picture is Armory um, 182, which is the one I'm gonna be talking most about today. So this is a class that I taught in Armory 182. It was global health governance uh, for global studies. Um, and you can see on that long view, it's a strange long room in the Armory, um, full of strange, uh, wonderful furniture um, and environments. It, if it looks chaotic to you, that's very intentional. It's a design space. It's meant for classes with a lot of um, ideation going on. And so um, you see the students sitting on the floor and writing on the table. So all three of these pictures are in the same class, uh, essentially the same moment. So you see the long view and then you see some students sitting on the floor drawing on the table. And then away in the back on the left, you see some students writing on the board. And then this is a picture of their board. Um, I need also um, your patience with my coughing. Um, it's allergies. The mold count is high today, so I may be coughing a little bit through this talk. Um, so this class, Global Health Governance, I also called it the Four Horses of the Apocalypse because um, death, destruction, doom, famine, plague, uh, it was a romp through these. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about what I did with the class a little later, but this is um, one of the main things uh, you can do with an iFlex classroom is that you can shift your students to different environments and in those environments, they can kind of colonize those spaces. And instead of bringing the students back together, what the rooms don't do very well is gather everybody together to lecture at them. So um, instead of having everybody gather back to sort of share back after they've been in you know, their breakout groups, um, we travel. We travel through the classroom, sort of visiting the countries, like visiting the groups and seeing their spaces, you know, which they've cultivated as their own. Uh, this next slide, 
is um, uh, Psych 11, and this was um, uh, an introduction to Eastern Europe class, and you see that the students are dancing. These are three different dances. These are three different groups teaching dances from the region that they were studying. You see the screens on the walls um, so that the instructions for these dances could be played on all walls of the room um, and everybody could dance. Now, I, I, I did used to make my students dance in ordinary classrooms. It's very difficult. You have to move. Uh, there's 50 people in, there were, um, oh, in South Slavic, there were 50. There were never really more than 25 in Introduction to Eastern Europe. But still, it's a lot of desks to move and, and you, you, you don't really have a big enough space to dance. I have had 50 students dancing the Kolo, the ubiquitous Balkan dance, um, in a traditional space that was painful. So I love iFlex classrooms for being able to dance. So um, hang on, I didn't always teach uh, through dancing and spaces and wandering around the classroom. I began as quite a traditional teacher. Um, and when I first uh, taught, uh, started teaching South Slavic and Eastern European history and culture courses, I was quite traditional. Um, and, but I was frustrated with traditional methods. Um, teaching general education, you have students from all across campus. And when you're teaching um, sort of complex and violent histories, uh, these are some images of Bosnia, for example. Um, the fact that uh, in Bosnia, um, you had uh, uh, Croatians, Bosnian Muslims, and Serbs fighting both uh, for the partisans and uh, fighting um, in fascist units um, with the Nazis in various ways so that they were fighting each other between each other, but also fighting within uh, their own cultural groups. And uh, what I discovered uh, here on our campus where we have a lot of heritage students from these regions, they would come in with stereotypes and uh, leave with their stereotypes reinforced rather than challenged. Uh, in the traditional methods of teaching, despite my attempts, and that other students coming in without stereotypes, left with stereotypes. Um, I was um, very frustrated at not being able to um, get them to stop othering uh, the Balkans and seeing it as this violent place, which some somehow had nothing to do with them. Uh, and then another problem which uh, any faculty in the audience can relate to, uh, how do you get them to read at all? Um, so you're asking them to read in order to understand uh, these complexities. And they're not reading as well as you want them uh, to be reading uh, in order to get what you want. So I puzzled over this uh, for a couple of years um, as I struggled um, to teach these courses well. And I had a brainstorm and this, and this was it. Um, I extracted the information I really wanted them to know and I put them on the back of playing cards. And so instead of giving them study guides with the questions they should look at as they were um, reading the various texts, I had them um, and I put these in order so that they could print these up, cut them out, have a stack of cards in front of them. And um, as they read, they could just write the answers to these cards in the back. And once they had these cards, there were so many things we could do with them. So you can think of this as a test bank, but what can one do with a test bank with a set of questions that might be tested? But there are 10,000 things one can do with a deck of cards. So one of the things I did was to start doing whole classroom board game type sessions. Um, so uh, I just pulled a piece of the rules from one of these games to put on the screen here. If you roll a three, uh, you've been attacked by the Holy Roman Empire if you're Slovenia, you've been attacked by Hungary if you're Croatia, you've been attacked by Byzantium if you're Macedonia, you've been attacked by Bulgaria if you're Bosnia, Venice if you're Montenegro, Bulgaria and Byzantium if you're Serbia. You have to fight and you fight by uh, answering questions and then you lose money. And I, money was always uh, glass tokens and little cloth bags and they clanked and uh, students love getting money and they hate losing money and um, so I um, this evolved over several years of, of learning how to do it correctly. Um, I after the first year when I sort of tried it once I realized that I could tell the whole history of uh, Eastern Europe uh, that last uh, game oh these are both from the South Slavic so I did this in both my Eastern Europe class and in my South Slavic cultures class but we could actually walk them through a changing boundaries and geographies and alliances of history by literally moving them from group to group as um, their membership in these groups changed. And I gradually added more role-playing like 
um, aspects to the course. I found that if they had a role and if that role had a name, they were uh, much more um, engaged. So Imperial Game Master, Omnipotent store Scorekeeper, more or less Moral Tax Collector. So I had people in charge of the money and the stats and the this and the that and the asking of questions and the answering of questions. And um, it all ran really smoothly and was always lots of fun. Other things that happened with those cards is that um, I would give the students the option for a final project in the course in lieu of a term paper that they could create um, a game. And uh, having this huge deck of cards, of several hundred cards, I gave them a big boost in terms of mechanics. And yeah, I, I said we played with the cards. One of the things we did with the cards was sort them. We sorted them endlessly as another cognitive task. Now, this is something you absolutely cannot do with a test bank. So your test bank full of questions that they might be asked in a final exam, there's no cognitive task there other than memorizing, memorizing and spitting back. But if your questions and if your facts are um, in a deck, you can sort that deck. You can think about the categories. You can think about what goes with other things, relationships between questions. And those relationships between questions lead quite naturally to um, sort of board game um, uh, sort of challenges and other sorts of historical simulations. So some of these games that kids made for me through the years were more like simulations and some were a more sort of light and fun. Okay, so um, speaking of light, um, I also started to add light role playing in groups where I wasn't using um, big board game like um, activities. Um, so on the uh, left on the bottom there, oh, I guess I have a pointer, I can say these guys here. Uh, these were the students you saw earlier in, uh, in Armory 182. These are the these are the four horses of the apocalypse students. And one of the things I did, um, they all wrote a white paper, a policy paper um, by the end of the semester on an area of the world and a, a kind of type of human tragedy most interesting to them. And instead of just having them write these papers and then you know, maybe present them at the end of the year, we just said, um, give your, make a character and uh, your character is gonna write this white paper and this character is from the region and your character might be a, might be a scientist, might be a medical person, might be a parent, might be an activist, and it's up to you, politician. And then you write from that perspective. And at the end of the semester, we're going to have um, a budget meeting for a large international organization. And you're gonna justify your proposal and you're gonna ask for money and you're gonna have to argue why um, in, in terms of making our budget decisions and priorities, your project is more important than other people's project. So that added, um, very light role play, which adds a tremendous amount of engagement to student experience. On the right, what you see there, and I get to show you another iFlex classroom. This is 432 um, in the armory. And you see this is um, the group representing Croatia, which is giving a presentation. Um, they, they, this idea, it was completely their own, how to do this presentation. You, you can sort of see that on the walls, they've put a roaring fire up. So all the panels on the wall show a roaring fire and they're sitting on the ground and these guys are being children and this is being, he's being an old man and he is telling the lore um, of Croatia and they're asking him questions. And um, this they came up with, uh, you can see that they're engaged with it much more than they would be if they were passively standing while each of them was sharing back what their group did. And I can tell you that I have not met a course topic yet no matter how dry, uh, they can't be uh, made better through um, a kind of a narrative, um, immersive role play experience. And I take that as a challenge and in question and answer, you wanna throw a course at me and ask me what I would do, you know, feel free. Okay, so that brings us finally to the course this semester. So that gives you a background to say that I have been doing this for many years in many different courses on many different subjects. It wasn't like just one day I decided I'm gonna do something really complicated and ambitious in this course. So I came to this uh, um, also after spending many years working with the fine folks at uh, CITL um, and uh, talking and thinking and working with groups of people on how to use playful pedagogies or gameful pedagogies as I prefer to call them uh, to improve teaching um, across our campus. Uh, when I uh, decided to develop this particular course. So um, I used this book. So uh, one question I always get when I show 
my students having fun is are your students learning anything are you losing anything in terms of rigor when you um add these add these playful elements and absolutely not as my students can tell you there's several in the room i work them very very hard um, this is one text we used in the course. It's an undergraduate level book. The graduate students were a little frustrated with it because the chapters were not written by area experts. Um, but it was a survey of um, computational propaganda uh, as it's been used um, across the world in a sort of a comparative study. So it looked at um, Ukraine, uh, Poland, uh, Germany, Canada, um, the United States, uh, Russia, uh, etc. And so while we were doing those comparative cases, the students chose topics uh, that they wanted to follow um, in a series of blogs that they wrote during the year. And these have turned out to be uh, truly uh, remarkable, uh, partly because the students were just an amazing crop of amazing students, um, but secondly, because of this historical moment. We're in the middle of a really unprecedented uh, election um, season with this really unprecedented pandemic event occurring. And my students have been watching the media. So for four months, they've been tracking the media, uh, looking uh, with quite expert eyes at um, issues in a variety of places around the world. You can read from the headlines here that they've got Hungary and Germany and, uh, and Russia here. And if either, now that I have some Reese and EUC people here, if you have any money for graduate students this summer, I would love to have my graduate students working on um, making these blogs sort of publicly available because as uh, data, um, they're quite interesting because of what they were watching. So um, they, I want to say that they've been doing this um, all semester while we were doing some other things as well. So this is the other text that we used, which is also a little bit of a mediocre text, but it did what I needed it to do, which was it gave us um, my style test bank, which is several hundred um, uh, theorists, uh, theories, um, and uh, st strategies, rhetorical manipulation, logical fallacies, um, that we could extract out of this text as uh, interesting and useful to us. And um, then, of course, uh, turn them into something um, gameful, which um, I was sort of anticipating. Um, trolls at play. So uh, these were plans that I made while we were in uh, the classroom, in, in the IFLEX classroom, Armory 182. I wanted to use everything that the Armory could give me um, to create, to take this information, oh, here it is, this is the card I was looking for, uh, to take that uh, non-test uh, uh, test bank um, and turn it into a set of cards, which again um, could be played with and sorted in a variety of ways. So we had theories, we had theorists, we had rhetorical strategies um, that we worked with in a variety of ways. Oh, and let me just go back really quick, oops. Oops, now I'm going absolutely the wrong way. To say that this, um, that we made a website where um, all of these terms, um, we came to consensus about um, what the correct understanding, definition or answer was to all of these um, when the students worked with them. So it was not a wild, wild west of meaning necessarily. It was a wild, wild west in other ways, however. So what we did was we rolled a world. Since in my uh, South Slavic and Eastern European classes, the, the board that we dealt with was the historical maps of Europe. And I wanted to create um, a fake world, roll a new world. And my reason for doing that was that I thought that some of the issues going on in the world today are fraught, emotionally fraught. I have students from these regions, um, uh, things are very emotional, very personal, and I wanted them to be evil, basically. So I wanted them to be, become experts in disinformation. And I thought it would be easier to do that, to explore these, um, these strategies of disinformation in a pretend world. So we rolled it. We literally rolled dice. We determined what we wanted to uh, put in our worlds, and then we charted what we got. So the students in the groups named their countries. 
The five countries they created were Corico, Dodo, Ramalea, Unia, and Valens. And here are the, the raw resources that they had and the industries that developed with those resources. Um, and interestingly enough, there were also mismatches between resources and industries. So that was interesting. At the bottom, um, uh, you have some other banking information, trading units. Um, I also had them make money um, through doing some homework assignments that in which they competed against each other. I don't do that sort of straight up compete with other groups for points thing very often. What is sort of more traditionally seen as a gamification. I, I don't I don't do that so much, but I did do it to raise some money. And then we determined trade rivalries and um, trade monopolies. And then we just really stared at this data in the context of other information they had rolled for their countries. So uh, we knew their population, the kind of a government that was in power, um, what their opposition was. So those were fun. Uh, the, what was opposing what? Um, their inequalities of life, their freedoms, their ethnic situation, um, uh, their technological level and all these things. And then uh, we started creating cards. So they created hundreds, literally hundreds of event cards, uh, which uh, uh, were going to affect life on the planet, which they named Lurth, the planet Lurth. Um, so we uh, anticipated these cards don't yet have uh, the consequences, but these, but these cards had um, events which were going to affect our countries and give us material to work with in attacking each other's countries in a variety of ways. So here is um, the students creating the actual map of their countries. And they have, they're putting on here their industries. So they're sort of mapping their geography uh, to their industries um, and really creating um, the resource uh, planet as well, and also looking at various uh, vulnerabilities. Okay, so that was amazing. And as we zoom toward finally being able to play, this was the sort of exciting culmination. In Armory 182, you have these years, in which uh, these years, these walls, they're doors, <laughs> walls, years, walls, doors. These doors for a closet, they, um, what you can't see here is that there are actually doors behind. So you have more than four panels. You can actually roll these and get like six panels. And it's the most wonderful thing to ideate on. Um, you can have layers of ideas and networks and maps. And so, but what we put here were uh, we combined all the maps of their countries into one amazing geography. Dodo, which is an island country, is off here. You can't see it very well. Uh, Unia, Valens, Corico, Ramalea, and Dodo the Island, a set of islands over here. And we were so excited uh, to play. Behind this door are big, huge pieces of paper in which we moved this map to paper, which would have been boards, and we started to make tokens and things that would have been used on the boards. We already had cards, and we were going to, in this classroom, have these big board games, and we were going to have this wonderful romping play. And then, and then we were told we had to shut down. We had to go home. I went home without the maps. The maps are still in the closet. I haven't seen them since before spring break. The maps and the tokens, and all I can say is thank God I brought the cards home. Um, I had all the card decks with me, um, but not the maps. And I, I had a week, I had spring break to try to figure out how I was gonna take this immersive, embodied, incredibly sort of physical course. And I haven't really even talked to you about the role play parts of it, which uh, involved the diplomats getting together to talk and the spies sneaking around the classroom and a lot of like really active in-person role play, what I was gonna do to put this online. So um, that's really what I'm here to tell you about, kind of what I did. And um, it's complicated, um, but it was fun to unravel. It was sort of a kind of a big puzzle. So I had that, and then I turned the map into this. So um, to make this map of, of the planet Earth, I used this wonderful 
um, website called incarnate.com. And now you're all going to go home after this. Oh, you are at home. You're going to go into the next room. No, actually, you're not even going to go to the next room. You're just going to navigate to this website and start making maps. It makes incredibly beautiful maps. So I made Planet Earth, and then it also has um, a variety of little things you can put on your maps. And I was actually able to do what we would have done on the paper board. I was able to do it on this a virtual board. These little uh, women figures, this is fashion, the fashion industry, um, textile industry, which was also fashion, where Dodo leads and uh, Unia was the second. Um, you see oil rigs, um, you see the windmills as green energy, we have coal here, we have mining. Um, and uh, problematically, which I'll get to in a minute, we have food, uh, trade food up here. Um, so I was able to make that. But then the question was, it was static. It was just a JPEG, right? It was just a JPEG image. It's, it's not a board. And I looked at some of the like, put your board game online applications that were out there and the learning curve was too high and it wasn't quite right. And I didn't have full control. I would have I wouldn't have had control of the game or how it worked. So I opted for a low tech uh, solution. So this is my tech solution number two was Photoshop. And I put the sprites as layers and I could turn them on or off. And as um, layers in Photoshop, I could just move them around the map. And so here you see the tokens for the various countries there. Um, I moved this one so you could see that it's on its dock. So um, they're on their docks and they're ready to move and uh, here's the grid and the game was um, ready to play. Okay, but where is the, where is the manipulation? Where is the media manipulation? Where is the election interference? Well, here's the next um, online tool that I used. I used our very own web.illinois. Um, I made a WordPress site uh, using uh, the plugin BuddyPress. Uh, which allowed me to create a fake social media website. So uh, if you read the little um, letter that was on the opening screen before this talk started, um, it was a greeting from the Orphan General. I am the Orphan General. That's my role in this game, in this world. Um, I, I run the uh, United Lurthan Nations. Um, the Orphan General is an orphan uh, whose parents died at sea. Uh, that's how they decide that the orphan general, little myth of the world, and I'm supposedly objective. And I put up, oh, up here it says where I live, United Lurthan Nations Media Affairs Office, seventh hut west of the big coconut tree, western toe of eastern foot island, kingdom of Dodo, um, is where I live. And this uh, social media site, which credibly works just like a social media site, the students started making um, groups. Um, so these are discussion groups, you can join the groups. And within those groups, you can post, you can like, you can share, all that stuff. So we had a Lurthan social media site that went with the game. And then um, the groups started creating content for the social media site. So um, this uh, initial one was an assignment, but after that, I didn't have to tell them what to do. So initially their assignment was to make um, a PSA for their country that touted their industries that combined their national identity with their industries and um, a meme from their opposition. And the reason for doing this up front was so that the other countries had a head start in knowing how to attack each other. So what are their strengths? How, are, how is each country branding itself, which is of course a rhetorical strategy of manipulation, branding coming from advertising. Um, and then how um, might they be attacked? So um, um, here you sort of see it in a glance. And when I had this PowerPoint running on my desktop, these videos ran. And when I just tested it on my laptop here, um, they didn't work. I don't think they're going to. I don't think this is going to run. No. Um, but I can, I think. I can run it from here, which it's is our prepared to site. protect our citizens, and we'll go to great lengths to keep all of them safe. Hang on, let me start. We are over. always prepared to protect our citizens, and we'll go to great lengths to keep all of them safe. 
We always feel safe and balanced because we know our government is watching us around the clock. Our thriving industries give us job security. We use our diversity as an opportunity to grow together as Valencians. Our men and women from A to V live equal and free. Valens, we are mightier together. 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 That didn't turn out to be true, actually, uh, as you'll see. All right, where did my... PowerPoint go. There I am. Um, I'm not going to be able to show you all of these, unfortunately, unless you ask to see them later in the, um, I don't have time, um, in the Q&A, if you want to see any of the other PSAs, I'm happy to show you. So here's Ramalea, and it advertises itself. I don't think this is going to run either. They were all embedded, and now they're not working, sadly. Um, and so their opposition is taking on their dependence on coal, though they they sell themselves. The number one in tourism is Ramalea. They, they're sort of alpine to the sea, a very beautiful area. Um, here is Unia. Um, and this is a funny um, trolling meme. No politician can unify people in the way that the Unia video seems to have united every single person against it. It's pretty smarmy little thing. Um, and again, some self trolling there from Unia. I can try. No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, and Dodo, this is the island community and they're trolling. This one I think will work. Just the YouTube videos stopped running. Why would you want to visit this place when you can come visit Dodo? Our beaches are clean and our people are friendly. Come to Dodo, you'll never want to leave. We have equality and you'll enjoy all the rights of citizenship from day one. You can travel from any coast of Greater Blurth to enjoy the beaches of Dodo. Cheers! I'm the Queen of Dodo and I approve this message. This message is brought to you by the people of Dodo. Okay. Mm. I keep losing my PowerPoint. There we are. Um, so they made these PSAs and then they, um, and then they were let loose. Oh, right. One more. I'm sorry. Um, I forgot about Corico. Corico uh, is run by a pharmaceutical company. Interestingly enough, its government is run by a pharmaceutical company. And so, of course, they're also um, dinging that. All right. Um, so the next uh, resource that I had for taking this course online was um, the Illinois Wiki. So the course uh, Wiki, which existed prior to going online, was how we communicated with one another um, on everything important we needed to know. And so I was able to set up um, the game um, through the Wiki before we actually were Zooming together to play. And so here are sort of roles that I gave. And these roles, which were useful in the classroom, became even more important online. So we're all going to be in a Zoom room together, but I needed them to act uh, as groups, in groups, but they weren't going to be able to break out because we were, I was sharing a screen. We had multiple screens to look at. Um, they were not going to be able to um, um, break out to speak together, they were going to have to use um, the almost all of them use group me, some of them used uh, chat. So they were going to be chatting together in their group. So I needed people, um, the chief decider, somebody's just going to have to decide it's going to have to move fast, they're going to have to make a move. They had a public relations person who was going to speak. The media maven, this is somebody who was immediately posting on the MyLearth site after any event happened in the game. I had to thank you, Joe, if Joe's in the room. He did an amazing job as the banker. So I I didn't have to change any statistics during gameplay. I could just worry about the, about the board. We had the diplomats who had one chat together making legal deals. We had the spies making illegal covert deals all at the same time. On the wiki, they had secret pages where um, they could get uh, messages from their handlers. So they were all cultivated to be um, 
agents of disinformation. They were contacted by the ministers of disinformation by their countries, and they were asked to create um, a guide to disinformation tactics to be shared with other cells. And then they were asked specifically to create disinformation campaigns, comprehensive disinformation campaigns towards other countries which were strategic for their own countries, industry, and political well being. So um, I had that static e page. I mean, not static completely, but I had the wiki to work with as well. So then um, you can't believe with what terror I faced the first class online on Zoom after spring break. You can see I put a typo here in the top line. I was typing so fast and so nervously where I set up uh, one um, set of instructions when we remembered that we didn't know if Zoom would work or if Zoom would crash based on the load of people who are gonna be wanting to get in there. My own class had only um, uh, you know, 22 people so we weren't gonna sort of crash it ourselves, but I was worried. So I had a, a plan for to do it asynchronously um, on the wiki, uh, still using the, sort of the online pages and then just having it go much more slowly. But uh, luckily we were able quite easily to do it with Zoom and GroupMe. It worked brilliantly well, um, it moved smoothly and we ended up playing um, uh, seven class sessions we played the game this semester. So this is um, on the wiki. This is the page that Joe was constantly updating. We had um, what happened in each turn. Uh, we determined the term order based on how much money they had. Um, they would, could either take um, a world event card, which I'll show you some of those, or they could answer a question card. If they answered a question card, they got a, a resource. And then after that, they moved around the map. They could trade with each other. Um, and uh, they could also give um, public relation announcements. They could um, do policy and all of this uh, people would respond to on social media. So, um, so then uh, during the game, I would flip between that stats page and the map and they would, um, you know, country by country decide where they wanted to move. So previously I mentioned, so we have a configuration here, which is from I think game five-ish or six, I can't remember now, uh, where um, from the statistics, and we knew this from the beginning, this piece of property belongs to Ramalea. So Ramalea uh, owns the Arctic and goes around the planet and owns this land. But the food on this land belongs to Coraco. Coraco has been selling this food. So, on, so they've been farming on Ramalean land. And um, uh, this became a dispute and they uh, looked for allies and Valens allied with Corico and Dodo uh, allied with um, Ramalea and Unia also allied uh, with Corico uh, somewhat less enthusiastically. And we had a situation where it could have gone to war. Um, I made a war board just in case and I received this amazing letter from the king of Ramalea. So this came to the orphan general um, through our social media site, uh, asking me to intervene to recognize the land as Ramalayan land and to dispute Coraco's claim to the land, et cetera, et cetera. I, this is my response, uh, which I gave in character, uh, saying that uh, the previous several orphan generals ago um, had decided that it would have to be decided through arms. I mean, so if they were unable to peacefully resolve it themselves, we would not step in, um, and, but that we would give them reasonable interest rates. The World Bank would give them reasonable interest rates on the purchase of weapons. So I gave the banker a right to sell weapons in behind the scenes deals to anybody. Uh, to um, the disappointment of some, they resolved this without war. So that one went without war. So, uh, and this is the last app that I used. So behind the scenes here, you see all these thousands of um, cards and I could have just randomized them and picked them, but it wasn't in the spirit of online. They couldn't see me do that. They might've thought I was strategically picking um, events. So I just quick wrote a little program in Inform7, which is the programming language that I teach interactive fiction with. And I just quick randomized all the special events that they wrote. These are two events that never occurred. I just ran the program and it tossed up two, two sorts of events, but you can see how it worked. Valence debuts new clothing line, culturally appropriates the festival clothes of desert people. Opposition party goes up by 10%, majority party goes down by 10%. So um, they manipulate um, both industry and government. Okay, 
So these are some of the events that happened and some of the responses that came on social media. Baby Chewbacca meme fills the hearts of many. Uh, ruling party support goes up everywhere. Opposition goes down. Global mood is calm. And then immediately my students start creating, you know, baby Chewbacca memes on the social media website. And then um, this was another one that uh, a scandal says that Dodo, which is the only producer of gems on the whole planet, says they're fake. Um, and then the claim that Corico is um, making them. So this um, this was a big disputed thing and lots of yelling at each other and lots of use of rhetorical manipulation to troll each other. And then this middle one became a more important sort of geopolitically. Um, Unia uh, <laughs> had a fundraiser on behalf of Valens' underprivileged children, which caused trolls to start attacking Valens in terms of its abuse of children, which uh, really over the months really grew out of control, the attack of Valens on that. Um, all right, so at some point, Valens had to sort of step in and say, you know, this is ridiculous. Uh, we're not, you know, we're not abusing children and eventually, you know, sort of eating children's fingers of orphan slave labor. It, it got really out of control and crazy, very fun, just what I wanted it to do. And then um, the king, so the opposition in Valens was, um, king in exile. So it's a sort of a liberal capitalist system in Valens, but the king was still out there and then rumor had it um, that he was imprisoned, even though Valens said that they invited him home, et cetera, et cetera. The opposition was rallying around the king. So we had a lot of politics here. So, oh, this is what I referred to before that minority support went up and down based on events. Uh, we kept track of how much money they had. They got Every round they get money income from their resources. And then this is Joe's behind the scene. This is the World Bankers account. He kept his own accounts. We didn't know who had money or what, but um, these, um, these are in the millions. So 69 um, million lurthos, but they had in offshore money. Each country had way more money in offshore funds. Dodo has an offshore banking industry as well. World Bank had endless amount of money. And you see that by the end of the game, some of them spent down their offshore money. For what, you may ask? Well, as events uh, unfolded, um, most of them random and some of them chosen by the countries, an election was triggered in Valens. So the rules said that if uh, opposition support went up over 50%, it triggered an election. So how we handled the election was that each of the ruling party and the opposition posted on the MyLearth account and we did it by likes. Um, and there are only 22 people in the class, but you see that uh, this post got 28 likes. So that tells you something um, that there were um, every uh, country also had multiple fake accounts as well. So the opposition won, but the majority of Valens decided to contest the election. And since they had all been buying weapons illegally, they had the weapons to fight. So we got to have our fight. So this is um, the war map of Valens, and I see that I'm out of time. So I'm gonna really quick whip over to the actual, because um, you wanna know what it sounded like. Um, I can actually take you to hear some of the gameplay, and then I'll stop. So where are we here? Hang on, I have floating controls here. All right, so, um, so this is the war uh, while it was well in play. So these are all weapons. And how it, war is supposed to work is that it was sudden death answering questions. They would answer questions from the hard deck. We had divided the cards into hard and easy questions. And if they got one wrong, their army just lost. And that was supposed to be, and let me just let you hear some of this. No. Five. What is Umberto Eco's concept of hyper reality as described by? Oh, I asked that one. Oh, shoot. Really? Okay. Um, what is the purpose of raising capital according to Benjamin Franklin? And why is an American style rational or rationality? Actually, hold on. This card was. 
phrased in a really weird way. So uh, what's the purpose of raising capital according to Benjamin Franklin? Uh, I'm gonna default on that one. Actually, no, I still don't like that question. I don't like the way it's phrased. Um, so the woman was speaking as a gay master and she has the right to change the what, rules. Um, name a couple of ways that consumer data is collected online. So she threw out the question and asked another. Um, it's collected through like clicking in advertisements, um, the way that people interact with websites um, and comments like on social media. Yeah. And it's, okay. Um, Please explain to me what is conspicuous consumption. Okay, so uh, um, so they kept getting, anywhere. they kept, a, hang on a second, they kept getting everything right. And they got everything right uh, so much that, um, that we, the game masters decided because time was running out and this was our last game that we were gonna go to dice. So I have this nice Dungeons and uh, Dragons dice roller and we started to roll the dice just to lose some armies because they were so well prepared, they got literally no questions wrong um, as we were trying to fight and we weren't gonna have a resolution of the battle. So um, we rolled dice and we removed, I'm just whipping through the class period here. Um, it was super exciting, but the other countries of the world uh, wanted to get into the fighting. Sorry, I often had to switch to the dice. Um, until we were left uh, with something like this, um, Corico uh, got into the fighting as well, and um, it looked something like this towards the end, um, because Ramalea decided to invade Corico. And it looked like... It's drawn, we have to resolve the Valencian War. Dodo, are you staying? Um, um, they, they only have like a few armies left, so we'll, we'll, I mean, we'll stay. And, all right, uh, um, let's, instead of uh, letting the opposition fight, um, um, Dodo is going to try to take out the government of Valens here on behalf of the opposition. It will can all be over, except we have to resolve the other one. I'm going to a four. It's like 12 to four or something. Yeah. So um, you are fighting the government of Valens currently. And the government of Valens falls. Um, Dodo, are you fighting the opposition to take over Valens? Or are you going to? Mm -hmm. I propose to Dodo that we join forces and take over the rest of the world. And then they'll probably just take over us, but you know. So Dodo, you confer whether you're going to recognize the opposition of Valens as legitimate while I fight it out with Corico up here and okay. Ramalea. Take control. Okay. okay. We'll hard. respect that too. Um, All right. So what happened is Corico took over Ramalea. Uh, that was never the intent of the war, but it happened. And at this point, it looked like the opposition had beat out the original country. But then something untoward occurred. If I can quickly get back, that's not my PowerPoint. Um, the orphan general uh, had received a letter in the middle of the night, the night before the battle, um, by a citizen of Valens, letting me know that in fact the king of Valens would not be returned to the throne, but would be a puppet. And she requested, she was a spy for Valens, to buy additional arms on behalf of um, the king of, of Valens, uh, she told no one um, that she was doing this, she just did it. And at this point, can I get back to the right thing here? Um, let me see Dr. if- Dr. Pintar, I believe that there might be more forces in Valens that we don't know about yet. Yes, uh, unexpectedly, there has been a fissure in the opposition. <laughs> An additional army has arisen. Um, with yes, I believe you'll find that our numbers are quite vast. Uh, their numbers are vast. Uh, I would like to yeah, attack uh, opposition. Yes. Um, I think that this is inevitable here, even without rolling. Um, we, uh, <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> 
party has arisen and has toppled the government. Yes, here. I would like to found a new government in Dallas. Okay, so um, it was a very exciting finish at the end of the course. Um, the king of um, Valens was returned from his tower where he was enshrined. We had a new uh, kingdom like that. And now um, at the end of the semester, the students are um, finishing up their disinformation reports. Um, and of course, uh, as any good course should, um, they are demonstrating to me that they have um, mastered the material. So their disinformation plans moving forward in this world, in its new political world, are specific to what's happening. Um, they're enjoying that assignment as far as I can tell, and we're zooming toward the end. So I'm sorry to have talked too long. Um, we can shift back now to um, that's uh, the end. Now we're here um, on Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, I now know more of Dodo than <laughs> <laughs> well, here I am. I'm uh, I'm at the orphan general's hut here on Dodo here answering your right. Questions. So we started this conversation, and you told me that that was Dodo, and and I was curious to learn, and now I know. Um, as we said at the beginning, uh, please do uh, submit questions uh, for the speaker uh, in the chat room, uh, and I'm happy. Um, to share them and solicit uh, answers. Uh, I think there was already a comment uh, at a certain point. I think uh, people wanted to uh, know if it's possible uh, to have uh, the URL for the wiki page. Um, the wiki is currently a private wiki for the course, but um, as soon as the uh, semester is over and I can remove any a sensitive material that has to do with the students' uh, progress. Um, I can make much of the wiki um, public. So I will plan to do that, but I can't at the moment. Thank because you. Because it's, like, it's like their Moodle site and yeah. I think our, our first question is a little bit of a meta question, I guess. Um, I don't know. Uh, if you can answer this, but uh, but it's an interesting one. Uh, and it's, it's a question about what kind of role playing would you recommend to teach about role playing? <laughs> so uh, I, I, again, I, again, I, 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 to, I, I, yes, yes. Well, I said it as a challenge that I could come up with a role playing scenario for anything. Well, um, as luck would have it, um, I obviously I teach game design, so um, I I would um, make my students be teachers of game design. So I would um, put them in my own role um, and have them teach. Right. That maybe is a little I mean, bit I mean, of a cheaty I, one. Right, <laughs> but again, I think the uh, the, the, the question. The, uh, a little bit of a cheating one as well, right? I mean, you teach about role playing by making people <laughs> do role playing, uh, but um, but I do have a, uh, a perhaps a question. Um, so you you said that there is uh, no downside uh, to uh, teaching uh, classes this way, but can can I push you a little bit uh, on this and imagine instead that whenever we adopt any technique there is something we gain and something we lose uh so without assuming that we, we we what we lose is more important than what we gain uh what uh what are the critical points right i mean what is that uh can 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 be lost and what is because we, we clearly see what can be gained and use the word fun multiple times which of course is emotionally very important uh, are there any uh, perhaps minor elements that you think is uh, are lost when we teach this way? There's one really big one, which is that it takes really a lot of time. <laughs> so if you're trying to teach your courses with a minimum amount of prep, um, even when um, even when I've taught 
like I, I did several iterations of, of the role play in both the South Slavic class and the intro to Eastern Europe class. There is new prep every time because some of it is specific to the students and the content and new content in the course. So um, there was a tremendous amount of work, many over lo long nights, all nights, all nighters on um, getting this prepared. And then obviously if I wanted to fully engage them, if I wanted them to be fully engaged, I had to engage. So when they would write letters to the orphan general, um, the orphan general had to be a person. So, I mean, I had to engage. So there are some courses that we don't wanna engage with. We just wanna do our job, right? So then we teach too many courses. We can't emotionally engage with all of them or we feel the material doesn't lend itself to that. Although I think for myself, I proved in the global health governance class, which was not a course I had ever taught. I was asked to teach it. Um, I got the materials, the syllabus was written, and I was thinking, how will I survive this material? To me, it was very dry. Um, I could just teach it. It would have been easier just to teach the existing syllabus. And I thought, no, no, this is a challenge for me. This is material about really terrible things happening in the world, but I had experience teaching terrible things from teaching all these Balkans courses. So I wasn't afraid of teaching difficult things. And in walking the line of making difficult traumatic things fun, right? So I, so I did say it was fun at multiple times. It was fun. We just had a hoot this semester, but, um, but the fun is not the main point of it. The engagement is. So um, you could do this in a serious game where the simulation is more serious and less fun and get the same benefits of that that sort of immersion, um, the immersion in the material, um, th that and that the the output of that at the end wouldn't necessarily be fun. Right. So so um, th there is a question about again linking uh, what you teach with uh, courses that have a, a similar topic or a similar interest in terms of propaganda assessment uh, and um, um, other forms of uh, research on propaganda. Do, do you know if the students uh, are somehow uh, creating meaningful uh, synergies between uh, other forms of data gathering and your class? Uh, Absolutely. So there, there, there are blogs, as I mentioned, that they're doing this series of blogs. Um, their blogs are all informed by their ability to now, um, they have a literacy for disinformation. They have a literacy for rhetorical manipulation. And I actually practiced them on it. When I said that they raised money, how they raised money was I gave them uh, 35 rhetorical manipulations and I said, go into the headlines and um, for every different rhetorical manipulation, you can find me an example of and some of them cheated and just looked at the president's tweets and they got a gazillion just right off of his tweets. I said, you have to do more than the tweets. You need to like, you need to go on to Facebook and, and, uh, and lots of things and see how many examples of all these rhetorical manipulations you can find from all these domains. I think it made us all sensitive to how manipulative advertising is and PR is. So even ordinary PR, even positive PR um, that the same manipulative techniques, I think that surprised all of us as we started to just see manipulation everywhere. We saw it, of course, in the, the ugly kinds, like the trolling and the, you know, attempt at interference, but we saw it in a lot of other passive ways as well. So they were so sensitive to doing that. And then they had that lens, that sensitivity, and then they went to their chosen topic area um, which were um, very broad, as you recall, from that list of the things that they were looking at. So some of them are looking at the way um, that uh, alt-right rhetoric against migration has been changing. Um, and, and then uh, they saw how uh, the virus um, has emboldened uh, various alt-right um, uh, movements to uh, sharpen uh, certain of their narratives. And so um, a lot of the data they collected uh, was qualitative in nature, but some of it is quantitative. And I, I really would like to make these blogs publicly available because um, the data they collected is quite exceptional and interesting. They were looking at the way that left and right uh, shaped um, certain things that came into the news, not just the virus. Um, somebody was watching um, um, 
you know, the old political debates uh, around impeachment and what happened to them when they sort of left the headlines for all these uh, virus headlines, what actually was happening behind. So a lot of the students kept their eye on the thing they had been looking at before. And then that itself is interesting to see how some of these, um, these media narratives shifted with this big new news story coming in in the front. And then a, a several of the students just went straight at uh, a, a virus coverage um, from a variety of angles. So I would say that they did, despite that we were playing and having fun, that, that there was no downside in terms of their learning or their mastery. And in fact, seriously, um, I would put my form of cognitive learning against sort of memorization and, and testing uh, at any time. Not only did they sort of learn the material, they used it, they applied it. They looked for it and then they used it. They, they, they did these techniques and uh, they're gonna remember them and know them in a way that just memorizing them and giving them back um, on an exam uh, wouldn't give. I, I used to say that at my, my introduction to Eastern Europe students as well is like, if you think that they didn't learn the material for having played it or embodied it or lived it, you know, just I'll put my students up against on a test against any other students anywhere else teaching you know, taking introduction to Eastern Europe, right? In terms of what they learned. Yeah, we have an, a couple of questions that I think I can group together um, about how to steal uh, th this approach uh, for uh, students in high school uh, or shortcuts that uh, people can use uh, uh, taking advantage of your experience in organizing a course like this, right? So, as you mentioned, time uh, is uh, this is time consuming, and somebody in, in the chat room says that again that uh, the, the complex nature of the game uh, seems to be out of reach for the students of the classes the person teaches. Uh, is there a way to uh, further scale it? to uh, uh, people who don't have as much time or, and people who are teaching different grades? For sure. Um, and I, I knew I would hear that from people that this is sort of terrifying. Like it's neat and then terrifying and you couldn't possibly do it. But it would never have been this complex in the classroom, right? It was very, really simple uh, in the classroom. But, but the other role-playing things I've done in earlier classes were even simpler yet. So um, if you've ever heard a talk by any of the people in the history department who do the reacting to the past role-playing games, um, those are, um, and if you're uh, unfamiliar with it, you should, um, you should do an internet search on it. Reacting to the past is the, is the phrase, and it's almost a social, social movement across history departments across um, the country. Uh, which are teaching history through role play. And it's a, it's a model in which uh, students take the role of a historical figure. Um, it's writing intensive, um, where they have to, reading and writing intensive, they have to write speeches, they have to give speeches. I've done several reacting to the past workshops when they offer them here um, every year or so. Uh, our history department offers them. And instead of borrowing the whole reacting to the past model, which is very labor intensive, and they'll tell you that, um, I called it role playing light. It's role playing light. And um, you just add a veneer to what the students are already doing. So um, let's say, for example, you're, you're in a STEM kind of class where the students are in groups trying to design a thing. And that seems not amenable to a role play. Well, you just concoct a narrative storyline of an emergency um, uh, in, and you ask them to create a, a character, not themselves, that has uh, certain sensibilities and thoughts and feelings on the team. And they're still doing the exact same project and they're working together, only there's this extra veneer of, um, how can we say, self-awareness and you can put an ethical thing in there. You can say, okay, you guys are all working on this thing, but here is um, a piece of research which um, may have been ethically um, 
it's a key piece that they need for their project, but it was got through unethical means. Is your group gonna use it or not? And make that decision based on your character, not your own self. So if you yourself would never do that, but your character would, your group can go ahead and use it, right? So this is a very little game-like element, which doesn't change the essentials of what they're learning, what they're making, what they're producing, but engages them, engages the storytelling part of their brain, the narrative part of their brain, um, to just be a little more fully immersed in the, in the material. I, I think I've talked to CITL about doing a, a, a workshop where, or, um, uh, where we would actually ask people to come in and bring their syllabi. And we would collectively look at them and see where there were opportunities uh, for adding narrative uh, elements that would be um, not as complicated as this whole thing that I did, right? But um, just a, a, a way to start. So I think probably we will do something like that. Okay. Um, I, I, there are, of course, a lot of compliments in the chat room that I'm not uh, going to repeat, but they are there for you to look at. Um, uh, I think we, we have been uh, going at this for one hour and 10 minutes, so I think you, you deserve some time for yourself <laughs> after spending so much time uh, designing the course and helping us understand uh, your method. Uh, we're very grateful. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, if you have uh, final remarks, uh, uh, otherwise, uh, uh, again, I hope to see uh, at least some of you uh, back on, on Wednesday, uh, and I'm sure that there will be uh, other opportunities. Uh, we will post uh, the uh, presentation on our website. Uh, so uh, do not uh, hesitate to go back and, and look at things. And sometimes again, during the presentation, uh, it's, it's hard to, to follow, but then you have an idea and you want to check something. So this will be available for people to uh, do a double take uh, and uh, for other people. So if you know of anybody who might be interested uh, in this, um, uh, I think uh, certainly uh, the students are having a lot of fun and that's very important. So uh, we also had a lot of fun and thank you so much, uh, Judith uh, Pinter for this wonderful presentation. Thank you very much for having me. Um, people should feel free to um, email me uh, as well with uh, questions or thoughts. My email is um, just jpintar at Illinois, um, feel free. Um, and I'm always excited to talk about this particular topic. So thank you, Great. Emmanuel, very much for having me. It was really fun.